heard about famous teams in history, Michael Jordan and the Dream Team, the Grumman Aerospace Team, which built the first lunar module to land on the moon, the team at Ford that came up with the famous Ford Taurus, the teams of soldiers who are victorious in Desert Storm, even the Beatles, who as a team produced some of our most memorable songs. What was it that made them so successful? Hello, I'm Megan Beyer. Today we're going to see what great teams are made of and help you and each of your team members behave like a peak performing team. Think about the teams that you're a part of. It could be a work project team, a community or church group, even a member of a family. The principles of peak performance that we're going to cover today apply to any kind of team. And remember, a team doesn't necessarily mean a big group of people. Any grouping of two or more means you're on a team. Our presenter today, Ron Archer, is the author of On Teams and serves as co-founder of Archer & Associates, a motivational training company. Ron works with numerous companies, governmental agencies and organizations, as well as the National Football League. And thanks to that association, we're in for a special treat today. Ron has graciously arranged for Stephen Braggs, former NFL player for the Miami Dolphins and the Cleveland Browns, to join us later in the show. Stephen will share with us his first-hand experience, not just on the football field, but from another organization he worked with as well, Disney World's Magic Kingdom. First, some housekeeping. Each of you has received a packet of participant materials. Keep it handy as we'll refer to it throughout the program. Our telecast is interactive with downlink sites across North America, representing a wide range of industries, businesses, nonprofit, governmental, and educational institutions. We welcome all of you. We will have two question and answer sessions during our program. Please take advantage of this opportunity to talk with Ron. We'll let you know when the phone lines are open. Questions and comments may also be sent by fax or email at any time throughout the program. Well, we've got a busy two hours ahead of us, so let's get started. Today we're going to learn how to transform your organization and work groups into peak performing teams. We'll learn about the five stages any team naturally goes through and how to successfully lead a team through each of those stages. We'll discover the importance of setting a vision, empowering team members and providing measurement tools. And finally, we will master what Ron calls the five C's of peak performance coaching. With our complex, fast-paced world today and very little loyalty between employee and employer, getting people to work together as a team is more challenging than ever. So let's find out how to tackle that challenge and meet the master of peak performing teams, Ron Archer. Ron, welcome. Thank you. Why is it? Why is it so hard to get people to work together as a team? Well, according to my favorite author, Dr. Peter Drucker, the average American organization today is facing the three C's of overwhelming complexity, increasing competition, and tumultuous accelerated change. That if an organization is going to be able to sustain a global competitive advantage, there must be in many cases a philosophical break with the past. The days of organizations being able to divide the workforce into the heads and hands and thinkers and doers are coming to an end. Because if my organization can collectively outthink yours, I'm going to eventually whoop yours. And we want to separate the winners from the whiners so that every team today can become an agent of change and not a victim of change. And with all that change, it seems that teamwork is so much more important. It's vitally important today for organizations to be successful. And that's the idea. They're basically, my friends, according to our research in the last 15 years, working with NFL teams and corporate teams, three reasons why organizations are using teams around the world. Number one, the leadership span of control for frontline managers is increasing exponentially. Two, our customers today are driving this need to build teams, and technology today is increasing brain power and intellectual substance to be able to work together more collectively to achieve an outstanding result. It was John F. Kennedy who wrote these words, and I quote, he said, 
that we have come over on different ships, but that we're in the same boat now. We either learn to work together as friends or perish as fools, for a high tide will raise all of our ships. Even the great philosopher Hegel said these words about teamwork, and I quote, he said that truth is not found in a thesis, nor is truth found in the antithesis, but that truth is found in the emergent synthesis that reconciles the two extremes. And that means today that together, working as one unit, we can accomplish many things, but understanding that teamwork is difficult. Let's look at each one of those three reasons in more detail. Why are organizations creating teams? A lot of headache, a lot of heartache, a lot of time and energy, so why is it happening? The first reason is that the forces of global choices and the epidemic of quality are increasing almost exponentially the leadership span of control in these United States. About 15 years ago, the average span of control for a frontline leader in an American organization was one leader to seven individuals. That's pretty easy to motivate seven people. I can see seven people. I can talk to seven people. I can get my hands around seven people. Well, today, that span of control as American organizations have been shrinking vertically and growing horizontally, we're asking leaders today to do more with less support. It's grown from 1 to 7 to 1 to 50. By the year 2003, the span of control for a frontline leader is going to grow from 1 to 50 to 1 to 100. Not just 100 people who are homogeneous, I'm talking about 100 diversified, independent thinking, asking why, questioning authority, what's going on, who said, how come. The days of one leader, hear me today, knowing enough, about enough, fast enough, to do enough, to make a difference enough, is coming to an end. That's why, out of necessity, organizations are moving toward teams. Not because it's a good thing to do, and it's touchy-feely, and I love you, you love me. It's about survival. Because these 100 people are not just diverse, but they're also across three operating shifts. They may be in different geographic locations. So how can one leader maintain command and control over that particular environment? Even Lee Iacocca wrote many years ago, he said, I had to learn how to lead, how to follow, and how to get out of the way. That's the ideal. Even Saturn taught us about the value of teamwork, and that is the people that do the work every day, who answer our phones, who make the cars, who make the beds, who spend time on the front lines, they know how to do that work well if we learn how to lead, learn how to follow, and learn how to get out of the way. And how does it happen? It happens incrementally. But I will say this, if a leader today does not develop an empowered workforce, he or she will not be a leader for very long. It's like having a teenager who can drive the family car. How many parents actually say, hey, you turned 16. Oh, that's great. Here are the keys. Go drive. It's Friday night. Come back. <laughs> Whenever. Not where I grew up. They would say, oh, you turned 16. The boy can still count. Here are the keys to the car. Just sniff them. If they get lost, you can find them now. And that's our dilemma. We leaders, we're facing double messages. We're being told on the one hand, let go of your authority. Trust your people. Create kumbaya. But then in the fine print it says, oh, by the way, if you don't reach your numbers, we're going to hunt you down and shoot you. <coughs> this is why we have to build teams. How? Incrementally. The second reason why organizations find teamwork vital to their long-term success is that this is not a flavor of the month. This is not a management thing. You know who's driving this? Our customers, the taxpayer, the voters. Why? Because we have become spoiled by the multiplicity of choices. If you don't do it, somebody else will. And we want it yesterday. I crack up when I watch people go to drive through restaurants, you know, drive through windows to get their food. They wait there for two seconds. 
and they hear nothing. Hello? Hello, hello? I said, hello? They're so impatient. They want it now. And that's what's driving this change to teams because who likes to call an organization and you want your needs met, but I'm sorry, Ron Archer's gone. He's not here today. We can't help you. You don't want to hear that. Well, can't somebody else help me? Is this a cross-trained team? So the needs and the expectations of our customers is driving this change. You know what? For years, we've had an apex, a paradigm called let's reach for customer satisfaction. Now that sounds good, doesn't it? Let's satisfy the customer. We call this in psychology psycholinguistics, the power that pedantic nomenclature and academic jargon has on performance. What does satisfaction really mean? Go back to your grade school report cards. Remember the C grade? What did that mean? You did just enough to shut somebody up. No dean's list, no scholarship, no honor roll, just enough to maintain the status quo. The new challenge today, based upon choices, people today, hear me today, want to be delighted. Tom Peters calls it, we want to go through the wow experience. Wow me for my money. This thing costs money. I want to say wow when it's all said and done. Or as Kim Blanchard says, it is turning a customer into a raving fan who goes out and brags about you and sells your organization for free because they've been touched and moved and motivated by your organization. They sell you for free. They'll say, please, go eat there. Hey, I'll pay. Go live once, would you? And that's the idea. Now, we can achieve that faking it till we make it. There has to be a real passion for people. Psychologists tell us that I cannot give you what I'm not getting. I cannot offer what I don't have. And if I'm treated like a detached, isolated cog in the wheel who has no control over his or her workspace, has no say on decisions that affect what I do, how will, I, how will I treat you? How will I talk to you? You see, my friends, values and attitudes are caught, not taught. J.D. Powers and Associates realizes that the key to this whole concept that we call MMFI, do you make me feel important? Do you value me? Do you make me think you really care about my needs? People don't care how much you know, do they know how much you care? They studied an organization that put its reputation on the line. The United States Postal Service was being tracked and challenged during the holiday season against their for-profit competitors, the FedEx, and Airborne Express. Tracking and measuring on-time delivery, tracking and measuring customer satisfaction and delight. And everybody knows they don't have a chance. They're a government agency. They can't beat a for-profit stock-holding organization when it came down to it in every category. They knocked them out the water. You know why? Because they've understood that they're not in the delivery business. They have a new vision. They said, we are in the peace of mind business. When you drop something off to us, we're going to give you peace of mind. If we can't find it, we'll still give you peace of mind by tracking it down. And that's the idea today. It's not just the service. Hear me today. When price is the same, when product is the same, when quality is the same, what makes the difference? You.